Doc Talk is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Hey folks, Dr. Dan here. Thanks for joining us. We're going to have a grand show. We have Dr. Kelly Owens, who's a pathologist here at the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, who does a lot of cases for calf scours. And we're going to talk about different things from which bugs affect calves, some of the risk factors associated, and then how you send in samples and some of the pitfalls that can happen uh, to make sure that you get the right answer for your calves. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life. It's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do. Every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix Colostrum Supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Closed captioning brought to you by Vet Gun with Amel and new AMA Abamectin Vet Caps, the one two punch against horn fly resistance from AgriLabs. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Kelly Holmes. She's a clinical associate professor here at Kansas State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, and she is a pathologist in our diagnostic lab. And well, what does a pathologist do? <laughs> Well, that depends on what day it is, Dan. Um, <laughs> so mostly um, any sort of tissue samples or whole animals. So necropsy examinations, um, taking in samples from field necropsies, and then lots of biopsy service that we do here at Kansas State. Um, lumps, bumps off any kind of animal you can think of. Okay, and so then you get it, and then once you get it, you kind of direct the case, whether, you know, what what what's requested or, or what you might think add would, would add to the case yep. um, based on what you find. We try to take into account the clinical history that we're provided. Obviously cost is a factor. Um, that's dependent on what the, the client, the veterinarian, or the owner wants to do. Uh, but trying to get an answer in the most economical and uh, time effective way that we can. I love when Dr. Alms has my cases. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk about calf scours today. So kind of give me a rundown on what different bugs we're, we're thinking when we think about calf scours. So typically calf scours that we see are usually a combination of things. Um, it's rarely one agent, but the things we think of are both bacteria and viruses. So rotavirus, coronavirus, um, E. coli in young calves, Salmonella, Clostridium perfringens, uh, and Cryptosporidium we still see quite a bit. Those are the most common things we see. And and, uh, you know, like you said, when there's a combination, you know, Dr. Upson would always say, you know, there's two reasons why animals get, get sick, either an over overwhelming dose of a pathogen or a stressed immune system, and there might be a combination of that, too. 
For sure, especially in the calf scours, because it's that window, we need to make sure there's colostrum intake. If you've got failure of passive transfer, that just complicates things. Overwhelming pathogen load um, and age of the animal, it all goes together. Okay, so on those pathogens, you mentioned two that are viruses, two that are bacterial, and, and then one that's like a parasite yep. or that. Can you, can you kind of give me a little bit of a background on those? So we often see rota and corona in combination, and they're actually really hard to tell apart clinically or histologically. Um, about the same age of calf, um, it really just causes about the same thing. Usually alone, they're not fatal, but it all depends on the state of the calf, the immune system, amount of dehydration, all of that kind of stuff. Gotcha. Um, e. coli, same thing, um, can be a little bit more fatal by itself, and usually that's even younger calves. Um, and it can, it can lead to death pretty rapidly. Um, Clostridium perfringens, salmonella, those are gonna be older calves usually, um, but also is usually pretty severe and leads to death by itself. Crypto may or may not, those calves sometimes survive, um, but then can be shedding the organism as well, infecting others in the herd. So, so all of these, the vi and kind of like us, you know, when we get a cold, it doesn't that big a deal, but if we get a complication yep. with a bacteria after the virus, sure. That's the reason why we have to make sure that we keep those calves warm and hydrated. Sure, yeah, any combination thereof, and they may have other things going on in the environment as well um, that's causing an overwhelming stress, and that if the pathogen is present in the environment, it's very likely to take hold at that point, um, and then it'll be a combination of things that can often lead to death. Cool, we're gonna take a break. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the risk factors with calf scours with Dr. Kelly Holmes. Hey folks, thanks for joining me on today's Cattle First Minute as sponsored by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica. You know, when we start to think about breeding season and turning bulls out, the one thing I can't emphasize enough is to get a breeding soundness exam done on your bulls before turnout. And some of the things that can happen during the winter, whether it's frostbite in certain areas of the body or there's things that can happen that, that will cause a bull to become uh, infertile are things that you need to make sure. The other thing that's very important on a breeding soundness exam is we have to make sure that we don't have lameness or, or issues with the feet because no wheels, no calves. So making sure that we have a sound bull structurally, making sure that we have one that's fertile and, and one that, that can produce enough sperm and enough volume with enough motility with no defects in the sperm is vitally important to making sure every year before you turn out to ensure that you get a calf crop, at least from the bull's point of view. If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix colostrum supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. When you're in the cattle business, no matter how much it's a business, it still starts with cattle. It's this basic notion that sits at the core of how we approach things at Beringer Engelheim. We understand when you put the cattle first, it just naturally leads to doing the right things. If you want to do well in this business, you start by doing right. Take care of the cattle, and they'll take care of you. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council. 
improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Kelly Alms. We're at Kansas State University where Dr. Alms is a clinical associate professor and a pathologist here at the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab at Kansas State University. And as we left, we were talking about these different pathogens, but there are some risk factors that will lead to calves succumbing to these, these pathogens. Sure. So a couple of things you want to think about. Um, typically, uh, calves out of heifers are more likely to get calf scours. Um, so that, that increases the risk. A year like this that's really wet right now during calving season, um, muddy corrals, not enough space for calving, not a clean, dry environment is going to really increase the pathogen load and probably lead to increased numbers of calf scours. Obviously, if they don't have colostrum, like we mentioned before, that's going to lead to an elevated risk factor. Um, the, the heifers, the cows, are completely clinically normal and shedding these organisms in the environment. So they're there all the time, and so you need to make sure that you try to minimize the exposure for the calves. And, and so, you know, there's a different risk factor. There's a reason why we, not just for watching the heifers that we calve them out before the cows, but also the risk factor of those calves born to those heifers might not be as, as immunologically competent as cows. Exactly, yep. And, and so, so calving those heifers out, uh, making sure calves get colostrum, uh, keeping the environment, um, which of the pathogens would you say that is more of an, in, or m maybe they're all environmental, but which one of them is more of an environmental issue? The four that I think of as environmental are the four main ones, which would be Rota, Corona, E. coli, and Crypto. Okay. I think those all are, are sort of environmental pathogens, E. coli maybe the most, um, but, but Rota and Corona a lot too, and I think people you know, they might have their pens where they calve them out and then they move them out and move the next one in and you don't rebed in between. You don't get rid of those pathogens. Um, obviously, if you already have calves with scours, if they're anywhere near where the new calves are being calved out, that's a big problem. Yeah, so, so if you're calving them in a barn, make sure we, we change bedding. If we're calving out in a lot and we have mud, we have to realize that the muddy or poop covered udders. Yep. That's a really good way to, is, to pass those on. To, is things that we need to, to prevent because that calf goes to nurse the udder and, and then yep. gets the, the pathogen. Um, time of year? Um, time of year doesn't make a really big difference because it's it kind of, in, it's environmental. So if it's cold out and they're, they're pushed more inside, then you're gonna have a, an increased pathogen load in that smaller environment. Right. So, and it depends on, is it a wet year, is it a dry year? If it's drier, you have a little better chance, especially if they're in a lot like you were talking about. Um, so time of year isn't maybe as important, except cold is obviously gonna increase the stress on the calves. And then when we have uh, overstocking or over density, uh, sure. We get more mud and get more pathogens. Sure. Yep. Um, instead, of, you know, sand hills calving. Instead of moving the yep. the pairs out, we should move the open ones or the ones that haven't calved out, so they are in the cleaner environment. Is that something that y'all recommend? Um, I mean, it just depends on what the what the veterinarian works with. We really try to work with veterinarians at the diagnostic lab, and then our hope is to give them the information they need to work with their clients. Perfect. We don't usually work directly with owners. Um, obviously, we, we do testing for owners, but we really prefer they have a veterinarian to help them sort of figure out all those management strategies. Awesome. When we come back, we're going to find out what happens to your samples when they get to Dr. Alms. where, no matter why, the Veterinary Health Center at Kansas State University is committed to providing quality patient care to animals and exceptional customer service to their owners. From routine checkups to emergency and specialty care, our world-renowned specialists and experienced professionals 
are here to discover, to teach, and to heal. Let us know. How can I help? How can we help? Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Supply. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Kelly Alms, and we're at Kansas State University. And Dr. Alms serves as a pathologist here and a clinical associate professor in the veterinary diagnostic lab at the College of Veterinary Medicine. When we have animals that are sick. Well, let's start out with like the live animal. Can we send in, what, what samples could we send in, in, in for, for diagnostics on scours? Sure, so the most common thing we get on a case of calf scours where the calves are still alive is mm -hmm. a fecal sample. Okay. So we want that to be, um, you know, we don't need a huge amount, but we need enough that we can sort of split it up and do some uh, multiple tests if that's what they prefer. We have a PCR panel that covers those some of those agents we've talked about, which is Salmonella, um, E. coli, K99 specifically, uh, rotavirus, coronavirus, and cryptosporidium. And so we can run that on a fecal sample um, or even a fecal swab if that's all that they can get. If there's enough, we could also do cultures. So we're not going to find the Clostridium perfringens um, unless we do an anaerobic culture. Mm -hmm. And then we can also throw in an aerobic culture just to make sure that we're covering all the bases. Okay. So, so a fecal sample on live calves, and you say not too much and not too little, roughly how much would you like? Oh, I, sure, a handful. That's a good amount. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Mouthful. <laughs> 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 um, so anyway, uh, you know, a tablespoon or yep. okay. Yep. So and don't put it back in the drawer. Now, the uh, um, what about if we have a calf that that dies? So if you have a calf that um, dies from scours, the best thing you can do is get samples as quickly as possible. Okay. So the intestine itself starts to autolyze or deteriorate immediately after death, especially in cases of diarrhea. It even happens faster usually. So if you can get um, your veterinarian out to do a field necropsy, or if you can get that calf to the diagnostic lab, or get the samples yourself, fresh intestine and feces would still be the preferred samples. Okay, and then if in doubt and you're close, just take the calf to the D-lab? Exactly, yep, bring that calf in, give us a little bit of history, um, definitely give us an age, um, and talk to us about what's been going on in the herd. It's really helpful to understand if this is the first one or the 10th one, how many you've lost. Um, and that also helps us gauge how quickly we really need to try to get results and how much money we might need to put into it. Okay, so once you get the, the samples, then will you run similar tests on the tissues that you did on the feces? Yes, or? so we can run that PCR panel on tissue or feces, whichever we have. Mm -hmm. um, we can also run cultures on the tissues as well. Okay. Um, being a pathologist, obviously, I normally recommend histopathology. Um, probably the least rewarding in this case. Uh, one, because that gut starts to autolyze really fast, but two, a lot of those pathogens we've talked about either cause similar changes or you may not be able to see them um, histologically under the microscope. So unless we've been having a pretty long going outbreak and we're really not figuring out what's going on, histopath is probably the last thing that I would do. So uh, PCR is a test that looks for the DNA of yep. the viruses or the bacteria. Yep. So they can be live or dead and we'll Correct. still pick them up. Yep, and that's the best part about PCR. Now it's not uh, an end all be all, and there can be so much deterioration if the genetic material is gone, we may not be able to detect it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it can detect, depending on whether you're talking about virus, bacteria, DNA, RNA, it just detects the genetic materials. You don't have to have live organisms. And it's pretty fast. It is pretty fast. Yep, we usually have all those turned around within a two day period. So unbelievable that you go from where we used to culture and wait for a week yep. to get results to now speeding it up with, with PCR. Definitely. And the panel covers everything. Yep. So thank you. When we come back, we're going to talk about some of the pitfalls that Dr. Alm sees with samples that are submitted to the D-Lab for calf scours. Some call it a come from behind victory, an unlikely win, a reversal of fortune, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. This is our moment. 
our victory dance because we choose confidence. We choose Zuprevo for BRD treatment. Ask your veterinarian to prescribe Zuprevo. Zuprevo is a fast acting, long lasting BRD treatment that you can count on to get the job done. Choose confidence. Choose Zuprevo from Merck Animal Health. If my calves start healthy and stay healthy, I've got a good shot at making money. That is why I trust Clostrix. It gives my calves the protection they need until their own immune systems kick in. Calf raisers trust Colostrix Colostrum Supplements. Colostrix is USDA licensed and proven effective. When your money is on the line, trust Colostrix. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Kelly Holmes. We're at Kansas State University, where Dr. Alms is a pathologist and a clinical associate professor at the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, and she sees cases from all around the world, um, and we're just blessed to have her at Kansas State to not only be a service in our D-Lab, but also when she teaches students. And, and so, <laughs> you know, the one we were talking about off camera was making sure you list the age of the calf. Yep. So and that's not like brand new or you know like one day versus 10 days can be a difference it does make a difference and when we get in a fecal sample without an age and they've asked for the calf scours panel which is what we call it we're going to run that but we may have just done some useless tests because uh, over about a week e coli k99 is not important anymore it's not right. going to infect those calves so it, we really do want to know the days how old is it one day is it 10 days is it two months it is really important so we think of E. coli usually happening first, mm -hmm. um, and then it can be in combination. Rodent and corona can happen pretty quickly at a few days of age, um, but we usually think of those a little over a week. The same with the salmonella and the crypto. Um, those are usually a little bit older um, as far as maybe a week or two. Mm -hmm. um, cluster name perfringents can really happen at any time. Usually those are older calves. Um, even up to a couple months is when we'll see the cluster name perfringents. And... Uh you know, so, so folks, it's, it's important that when you send something into a diagnostic lab that we make sure we have the history, any th number of animals, yep. the age, uh, and be specific on days. If you have the exact number of days of that calf's age, when did the scour start and when yep. did it die? Yep. Um, what about sampling? Uh, what are some of the pitfalls that can happen with with samples? So um, occasionally we will get samples that just aren't aren't worth anything. So somebody might send in um, tissue that's just too rotten, too autolyzed to get anything out of um, because it, clustered amperfringens, for instance, that's an anaerobic bacteria, but it's commonly found in the gut. So if you wait too long after death, it's going to proliferate and we're not going to know if we culture it, whether that was actually causing a problem or if this is just proliferation after death. Right. So then we're left with sort of more questions than we have answers. Yeah, and I've opened up some of those world packs or vet sleeves. Yep. And it's green and yep. it's and we're not gonna get anything. And that's frustrating also for someone if you go out there and take that sample and take the time to take it and send it in, you don't get an answer. Um, I'm sorry, but you know, garbage in, garbage out. If we don't have good samples and then proper um, ice. Yep, so ice packs, that is a problem. A bag with ice cubes is not an ice pack because that turns into water. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which then contaminates most of your samples usually or your box leaks and it gets thrown away in transit. Um, you also mentioned palpation sleeves. Yeah. So we will get palpation sleeves or gloves with such a small amount of feces inside of them that we can't scrape it back together to make enough sample to run a test on. 
So make sure that whatever container you're putting it in is the appropriate size for the size of the sample. Perfect. Any last wisdom? Um, no, I just, what you said, you know, when you're submitting things, give us as much detail as you can. Tell us if you've had treatment, uh, if your treatment's worked, if you've had treatment failures, um, and, and what we can do to help. Great. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for watching Doc Talk. Remember, if you want to know what we do, you can find us on the web at www.doctalktv.com. Always work with your local practitioner. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson with Dr. Kelly Alms, and we'll see you down the road. Closed captioning brought to you by Vet Gun with AML and new AMA Abamectin Vet Caps, the one two punch against horn fly resistance from AgriLabs. For more information about this program or previous programs, go to DocTalkTV.com. DocTalk was brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals.